Yeah, my name's uh, John G. Sutton. Welcome to uh, Tales from the Jails. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about my experience of being possibly one of the only individuals in Britain to be banned from HM Prison Wormwood Scrubs, which is hard to believe, isn't it? I mean, I'm delighted to be banned. They're not allowing me entry. To this very day, I am not allowed entry into HM Prison Wormwood Scrubs, which is or was at the time I was working there, one of the biggest prisons in Europe. And certainly C2 Landing, that's C2 Landing, in inside Wormwood Scrubs, that Sea Wing, the second landing, was the biggest single prison landing in Europe. It held approximately 200 inmates, and very often had that many whilst I was there. Among them, many notorious uh, prisoners, such as George Davis, he was notorious. Remember the campaign, Free George Davis, where they dug up the cricket pitch at Headingley in Leeds during the test match, and poured oil all over the wicket, people climbing up trees naked, banners all over London, free George Davis. Uh, George Davis, by the way, was a notorious uh, robber and villain from the east end of London who was on C2 landing, and I spoke to him, listen, I'll tell you something, George Davis was a lot of fun. He, had, he was a great character, I liked him, we got on really well actually, I mean, I was, well, I was the jailer locking him up. But I, uh, you could have a joke with George Davis. You knew what the score was. And that was the way that I, I believed you should work as a jailer. Not all this, get in there, boom, have some of that, you know. I mean, occasionally, occasionally, you'll get some nutcase who wants to attack you. But you will in society anyway. It was the same in the army. You'll get lunatics. I've, I've been hit numerous times with bottles. One maniac when I was in the army once crashed a full litre bottle of wine over my skull. Push all over it. There was bits of glass, wine splattering all over the place. No sooner had he done it than I just called the waiter over and said, excuse me, I said, uh, could we have another bottle of wine here? We seem to be running short. <laughs> the guy who'd done it, who was obviously trying to kill me, uh, looked at me as if to say, what am I going to do next? Exactly. What are you going to do next, mate? Because if you don't go immediately, something nasty could happen to you. But I mean, basically, I wasn't uh, an aggressive type, you know. I, I'd like to, to do it nicely. And George Davis, as I say, if he's around today and he sees this, you were a lot of fun, mate. He was guilty as hell of being an armed robber, which he definitely was. All right, he didn't do the job he'd been fitted up for. And he got, I don't know how many years, ten years, something like that. He hadn't done it. He said he hadn't done it. Maybe he hadn't done it. But he'd certainly done a string of others, which is what he was telling me. And when he got out, and he did get out on appeal, yeah, when he got out, uh, he went back to it and did a string more. And, guess what? Ended up back in the jail. But they wouldn't let me back. And I'll tell you why. Uh, following my exploits to try and bring in some sense into the system of having what's supposed to be a trade union representing the people who work in the prisons, i.e. prison officers, yeah? And they had, it that when I joined, I think all the, well, they still have it, the Prison Officers Association. But the Prison Officers Association was, in my opinion, and it was a monster of management. It was a beast of management. It was run by the management. Chief officers and principal officers were in positions of authority within the Prison Officers Association, and they were making the decisions. So that if you had any grievances about the uh, conditions you were working in, and you went to the Prison Officers Association and said, listen, uh, I, it's, it's ridiculous, you know, we've got... 200 men on one landing here we've only got 80 cells you know this is a, a dangerous situation and I am my life is being put in danger by the authorities and they 
believe this or not, the representatives of your trade union, the way you went to see, they were the people who were instructing you to do it. So they were the people who had ordered the situation in which you found yourself to be in danger and therefore, in my humble opinion, as a basic grade prison officer, I had no representation. Who was I going to go and see? So, listen, I decided that something had to be done about it. Uh, I tried to reform it through the Prison Officers Association. All you got was fobbed off, get lost. I mean, don't forget, if you're dealing with the management and you're subject to control by the management, which I was, and I got some of the worst damn jobs on, on escort with the most dangerous prisoners. I was put, believe this or not, I was put by the uh, allocating discipline officer, who, who was a, a principal officer, in charge of visits by the IRA. Now, part of my ancestry is Irish, yeah? I'm not anti-Irish, I'm not anti, I mean I don't like the idea of people bombing people, obviously not, but to put me in a, in a position like that on a regular basis, you know, was signalling me out, you know, they were kind of making me a little bit of a target there, but I never interfered with uh, the visits of the prisoners who were serving sentences for the IRA, I didn't, I just sat, I had to sit in on the visits, you see, I just sat back and let them take the place. I was supposed to be making notes and all that, but nothing untoward was ever said, so get on with it. I mean, it was just an oppressive situation to put these people who would, I quite believe that they believed in their cause, you know, they believed what they were doing was fighting for liberty, and basically, you know, you've got to understand, from my point of view, I believe that they had a right to express their their beliefs, not by murdering people, but if they're in prison, they're in prison, and they're not in there to be intimidated and abused, they're in prison. And that's all I did when I was uh, in charge of IRA, I mean, I don't want to be doing it, but I was put in there, and that was probably one of the most dangerous jobs in the prison. So why did I manage to get that job? I got it because I was telling the POA and all the senior members of staff and the junior staff that what was happening here was an abuse not only of the inmates' rights but of the rights of the junior staff. We had no rights. We had less rights than the prisoners. We got, you, you could get moved out. Listen, I had a chief officer and principal officer take me into an office, say, I want to, we want to see Mr. Sutton, into the office, yeah? And they said to me, you should keep your mouth shut. You're living in prison quarters. Think about that. Seriously, I had a wife and a newly born baby, and they're threatening me. I said, you really? You, I said, you too should be ashamed of yourself, threatening a man with his wife and child that you're going to take out revenge if I don't keep my mouth shut. I said, before I am a lot older, I will be dealing with this. And so, when I got myself back to Strange Ways, because I was originally from, trained at Strange Ways, when I got myself back there, I set up, started to set up an independent trade union that was not affiliated to the Prison Officers Association, and nor was it subject to control by the Home Office. It was purely to represent the junior non-supervisory grade prison officers, which made up about 60% of all prison officers. So how come 60% of all the uniformed prison officers were effectively without representation? It was because the POA was run by the management. And it was deliberately run by the management because that the way they controlled the staff. They could say, well, you've got a trade union. Of course, we did have a certificated trade union, but that certificated trade union was only able to operate because the Home Office allowed that trade union to use it, its premises for their meetings, 
it's telephones for making their calls, it's stationery, all the rest of it, all the telephone bills, it had no regional offices, it was not an independent trade union. And I formulated a complaint to the certification officer to have the certificate of independence of the trade union removed because the POA were not an independent trade union. They were, in effect, an agent of the management and were, to a greater extent, controlled by the management. At Strangeways Prison, they told me when I, I insisted that I didn't work overtime because I was studying, uh, I was studying for a, a degree and I wanted time off to do my studies as well as to be with my wife and family. And they told me, no, no, you cannot have your allocated time off. Your week, your holidays, your, your things are all subject to the discretion of the governor. Uh, because here at this prison, at Strange Ways, the Prison Officers Association have negotiated with the governor that we will have compulsory overtime. So uh, I said, you really think you can do that, do you? I said, well, here. So I gave it a letter in writing. I require to work to the terms and uh, of my contract. You know, I'll do 42 hours a week, whatever it was, work to the shift system, but I'm not working overtime. I said, that's it. You know, take it from there. You know, I said, and forget that. So what did they do eventually? Well, they expelled me they had at National Conference of the Prison Officers Association. They expelled me from membership of the Prison Officers Association. And at HM Prison Wormwood Scrubs, they had a meeting of the prison officers, that branch held a meeting which banned me from entry. I was not allowed as a prison officer to enter HM Prison Wormwood Scrubs. And as a matter of fact, the staff who took prisoners from Strange Ways to Wormwood Scrubs said, come and see me. And they said, what the hell's going on? They said they stopped the coach outside the gates and they came and searched the coach not looking for prisoners, weapons, or anything like that. They came to search the coach, looking for you. The prison staff were searching home office production coaches, vehicles, armoured coaches, you know, searching for me, because I wasn't allowed in. They considered me to be a threat to the security of HM Prison. I wasn't a threat to the security. I was a threat to the dominance of the Prison Officers Association who were, and in my opinion, may still be, an agent of the management. So, if you're, listen, if you, if you were a shipbuilder, would you have the manager of the shipyard in charge of your union? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Yeah. Or if you were, if you were a miner, a coal miner, can you can you imagine the manager of the pit and the owner of the pit as you, as the leaders of your trade union? No, you can't. It doesn't work. That's not how a trade union works. Listen, I know quite a bit about how trade unions works. My great grandfather, Robert Blakelock, was the general secretary of the miners' union in the in Lancashire, and he led the 1920 miners' strike in Lancashire. And he was vilified for it. But he wasn't an agent of management. He was his own man. He didn't drive around in a fancy car with a big house. He had a, he had a little two-up, two-down place on Penny Street in Blackburn. And he was a miner. And he led the miners' strike because they were receiving less less than living wages. Now the thing is, if you're receiving a pittance of a wage that allows you just about, just about on the poverty line to actually live with a roof over your head and basic food and just enough clothe, money to buy clothing for your family, then you are in effect a slave. You're a wage slave. And my great-grandfather, Robert Blakelock, recognised that and said, we can't do that. We have to stop. 
and he led the miners' strike. And listen, I didn't manage to lead any kind of union strike in the prisons, but I did stand up and tell them that the POA is an agent of management, it's a creature of management, it isn't effectively as a trade union, and basically what we're getting as members, basic members of this fake trade union, what we're getting is shafted. Yeah, and that is why I got banned from Wormwood Scrubs. And as far as I know, to this day I'm still banned, which is great. I never want to go back. I hope you've enjoyed Tales from the Jail.